10, you know, young ladies. If you think someone's a potential partner, you know, got an eye on them. You know, if they leave their Bible, you know, the church, go have a, just look through. Find out what they've highlighted. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is it they're looking for? If, you know, if, they, if, they, if they've got the Ten Commandments and it's got thou shalt not kill, underlines they must remember this. You know, you might back off a little bit. They're like, <laughs> they're not like, you know, if they've got to say, oh, must remember that one. Uh, anyway, it's got nothing to do with the sermon, but you can enjoy that bit of wisdom. We have been challenged by God to double down on what he has called us to do, the mission that he has for us. So I'm not going to speak about the doubling down side or the fact that doubling down on a mission. I want us to jump straight into today what that mission is. The mission that God has given to us as breakthrough is not just to exist here as a church, but it is a purpose. And it's a, it's a, a, a generic purpose in the sense that, yes, we're not the only church with this mission. You know, so we found a mission that only we can do. You know, we, we found, you know, the seventh, you know, candle in the tabernacle with the, the fourth thread, and then we've just discovered this truth that no one else knows about. I don't want to find those truths. I don't actually pursue, I don't want to, I don't want to be the only church in the world preaching a particular mission because that might just mean that we've um, got off, tra- off, off trail, off track, off rails, whatever you put in there. Um, but God has taken this mission and spoken us very clearly to us. What are we going to do with it? And that's to disciple, to be disciples and to make disciples, to disciple ourselves and disciple those around us and to disciple the, the community that we live in. And we will be judged by whether we have done everything we, can, we need to do and can do in order to get that mission out and to do it. And, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I, I, we won't be judged because, you know, um, thank God for grace. Um, I'm no, live, no longer living under condemnation and I'm no longer going to be judged. That's exactly right that we won't be judged for our sins. I am not going to face the judgment for my sins. Praise God for that. But we're still going to face what's called the Bema seat, which is the place of judgment where God would, would test and say, well, what have you done with this gospel I've given you? What have you done with your calling and your purpose and your mission? There is still a place where we have to give account for what we have done. And we want to get before God and say, we have done everything we could do to take this, um, this mission of discipling. So, you know, I, I've been sort of studying and thinking about this for a number of months, long, you know, for actually, you know, for obviously for years, but I've been doubling down on it over the last six months. And then the last couple of months, I've just been spending time. Because one of the things I really want to do is to say, you know, because we use that phrase, oh, we, we believe in discipling. It's a Bible word. You know, Jesus said, go and make disciples. He had disciples, the 12 disciples. It's right through the Bible. But it's not actually a term that I really use outside of my Bible conversations. I wouldn't, I, I'd probably, do, do you understand? If, unless I'm talking about Jesus and the church and disciples, I don't, there's no place that I'm really using it in the secular world. You know, there's some, there's some words that, you know, the word belongs out there, but the way we use it, it's not, we, it's, it's a unique sort of thing to the church, which means that there's a great danger we don't really understand it because we've sort of given it a church sort of meaning. Whereas in Jesus' day, it was not a church word. It was a word that was used by everybody. And so they understood the concept of it, whereas we, to us, um, can um, let, let me give you an example. If you take a word out of um, English, sometimes into another language, sometimes they will take the English word and just inter- you know intersperse it, insert it into their language. So you go around and you you know you listen to uh, someone speaking another language and everything. Da 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 da. Netflix. Da 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 da. You go. I recognise that. Or Coca Cola. Da 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 da. You know. Or or they'll they'll say something which is an English word but has now become just part. Now, say, listen, for instance, um, there are some languages when the concept of a car park, there was no car park, and so they just borrowed an English word because they didn't have cars in their language. and So they, they, they'll speak their language and they'll say car park in their language. But to them, the word car park has got no connection with, for us, car and park. For us, it's, it's actually make sense word. For them, it's just a word. For them, it's just the word they use, but they don't actually understand the root of it or what, you know, and disciple to us is a word that we've got from the Bible, whereas the disciples, they understood, it was a word they grew up with and knew in their language. And so I've been studying a lot because I want to say, what is a disciple? 
What is a disciple? Because you could say, well, a disciple is a Christian. Well, is it? What, what, what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it, um, what's involved in being a disciple? Because if I'm going to be a disciple, if I'm going to disciple others, I really want to dig down and find out what it means to be a disciple. So I studied that and I just did a, a big um, chart of all the scriptures I could find, especially through the Gospels. Every time Jesus spoke about being a disciple, making a disciple, what it calls me, and I just made this big list. And then I put it all together and I sort of sorted through it and I came through a number of things. I said, discipleship has actually got some very particular things. In fact, there's a number of times Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple unless you. So he actually made statements like, unless you do this, you cannot be my disciple. I said, like, whoa, okay, I better sort that out. <laughs> because if I'm not doing that, it doesn't matter if I'm doing all the other things, I'm not actually his true disciple. And um, there's, a, there's a time in the book of John where it says a whole lot of the um, people became his disciples, they became his followers, they, it says they believed on him. And all these people believed on him, but then he said to them, but unless you abide in my word, you cannot be my true, you cannot be my true disciples, or you won't be my true disciples. In other words, yeah, you can come to me, says Jesus, but discipling is more than just coming. Disciples is more than believing. And I thought, wow, okay, I need to double down on what it actually means to be a disciple so that I can make sure that I've got all these aspects working. And also when I go out there, I'm not, getting a, I'm not giving a, a, a clouded a, a message that is confusing to people, saying, just come and follow Jesus. And they say, what does it mean to follow Jesus? I know, come to church. You know, coming to church doesn't make you a disciple. Do you know what I mean? Is that right? Just coming and sitting in, in, a, in a pew doesn't make you a disciple. Just means you know you're here, you know, and you know you, you know the examples. You know, you, you go and stand in a garage doesn't make you a car. You can you know <laughs> go and jump in the water doesn't make you a fish. You, you, you can be you can be in the environment. You don't become that. It's more to it. And so, what is it to be a disciple? So, I what I did was I eventually I I boiled it down into um, six things. I said, the, a disciple loves six things. This is how I've, I've expressed it, all right? So you won't find a verse in the Bible that says, these are the six things a disciple loves. This is just for me working through all those verses. And, we'll then, and I'll work through these over time. I'm not going to do them all today, but I just want to just start with this. So if we put up the um, overhead. Let's say, so I says, disciples love. Okay, the six things that disciples love. Now, the first thing that disciples love is Jesus. And so I put him right at the middle. Because it's sort of he's essential, you know. I didn't even feel to make him one of six, you know. I mean, he's the thing that you love. If you're going to follow Jesus, um, if you're going to follow, if you're going to be a disciple, it's interesting. Um, see, the concept of disciple must be, is connected to someone. I tried to explain this online a couple of weeks and made a bit of a hash of it because I got the Greek words mixed up and and doing it online and and it was just like I felt I didn't quite nail it, and I'm pretty sure there would have been an amen for people trying to watch it. Because um, whilst in English, we just got the word disciple, in the Greek language, they had a few different words which were similar, but they had a different sort of meaning. All right, so can we skip through to the, um, the one that gives um, the difference between discipleship, uh, disciple and learning? Okay, a disciple versus a learner. All right, let me give you an example. In the Greek, there's two words, methano and methetes, and they're similar. One means to learn, but one means to learn in a, in a, in a discipleship relationship. Now, even though they're similar, there's a, there's a key difference. Methano is just the word that means to learn. And you get that um, in Matthew 9, 13. You know, it, um, I'll just read that to you. Don't it? Jesus, um, Jesus said to them, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion, not sacrifice. In other words, go, go and Google it, basically. If you, you know, go back to your Bibles and have a, a squeeze at this. Go, go and learn this. Go and understand this. It's just the, it's the, it's the process of learning something. But it's very impersonal. You can learn it from a book. You can learn it from the internet. You can learn it from someone, you know, some, remembering someone. But it's just go and learn this. That's methano. It's just the process to learn. But it's the information and the teaching is important. It's probably, um, oh, you know, 
there's a lot of um, I, I think like in universities, it's that that's the, the learning style. Lecturers get up and they just sort of throw material out and walk away. And it's like it's up to you. If you want to learn it, learn it. If you don't want to learn it, you're wasting your money. Um, I've you know there, there's sort of a no skin off my nose. I get paid to lecture this stuff whether you're here or not. And and um, often now they, they do lectures and then they record them. And I think university students says, praise God, you know, I can just, I don't even have to turn up. And, um, you know, I think Caitlin was telling me, um, Caitlin and Kyra, they, were, they actually studied university together. They, they studied together before Caleb was even on the scene in terms of this. So it was, what, a, what a connection that was, that the two of them were, were fellow students, just met at university. And... Um, they, you were in a class, weren't you, where the teacher made the, the, the strategic error of said, you know, you don't even need to be here, you know, or something like that. And they're like, they're like whoa, you meaning we get, we, this, this doesn't actually count for anything being physically here? And he's like, no, <laughs> next week, <laughs> no one turned up. They all thought they had to be there and that's part of the assessment. And so he made the strategic error, so you don't even have to be here, you can just watch online. And they're like, we will, because there was no connection. It's just information, just learning, just learning. Uh, you know, I, I can have one robot teaching me this week and another robot teaching me next week. That, that's the style. Just I give the information out. I read my lecture notes. I put the slides up. If you want to get it, you want to get it. Whereas Methetes is a, it's a different thing. It's, Methetes, is, it involves learning and teaching. That's why it's got very similar roots. It comes from the root of learning, but it's, root, it's learning from someone. You can't methetes without someone on the other end. Do you notice how often Jesus said you cannot, he did not say you cannot be a disciple. What did he say? You cannot be my disciple. See, disciples were common in that age. He wasn't saying you can't be a disciple because you can be a disciple. He said you just can't be my disciple. In fact, there's a great verse there, Mark chapter 2, verse 18, which sort of just highlights how they understood this. And it was this common common for them to understand. Um, verse, um, says, and this is Mark 2.18, and John's disciples, so John the Baptist, John the Baptist, his disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and said, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? John's disciples, the Pharisees' disciples, and Jesus' disciples. Do you notice you can't just be a disciple? You've got to be a disciple of someone. You've got to be connected to someone. There's no such thing as a disciple. If they say, if you went to someone who said, I'm a disciple in, in the New Testament times, the next question would be, of who? You don't, you, there's no such thing as a disciple. If you, go, if you went to someone and say, I learned Christianity, they'd say, good. But if you said, I'm a disciple, they'd say, who of? It's a person. You can't just be a disciple. You must be a disciple of someone. In fact, in the book of John, um, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, uh, John 9, 28. I'll, just, I'll, I'll read it out because this might be sort of helping you to, to see how they were seeing it. Verse 28, um, when the man was um, healed and the disciples were grilling this man that had been healed and he's talking about Jesus and they got all, you know, half of you with him and they, said, and they reviled him. Uh, this is... John 9, 28, says they reviled him, and otherwise they, they put him back in his place. They said, they said, you are his, talking about Jesus, you are Jesus' disciple, but we, we're disciples of Moses. Whoa, you know, we're real disciples. We're not disciples of this fly-by-night rabbi called Jesus. We're disciples of Moses. If you want to tell who, we're discipled right back from Moses himself. So even though we're, we're, we're discipling, they're just obviously not with a, a literal physical Moses there. They're saying through his teachings, but he's our teacher. He's the one we're connected with. See, you don't have a disciple by themselves. A disciple must always be connected to someone. And we learn, but you can't see... But um, uh, I'll give you another scripture, Matthew chapter 10. To give, I'm trying to give you an understanding when they use this word, how they saw it, because then we've got to see it. Because when we look at ourselves, we can say, well, what, if I'm going to be a disciple, um, coming to church doesn't cut it because I've got to be connected to Jesus. And I'm, when I'm asking someone, I'm not asking them to become a Christian, which means join a set of beliefs. 
I'm saying become a follower of a person, Jesus. I can't ask you just to follow the teachings. You've got to be connected to the person. Because if you follow the teachings, you can just be a Mathana. You can just learn the teachings. Mathetes is to actually be connected to a person. Um, Matthew chapter 10, verse 24. Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher or above his rabbi, above his um, uh, uh, master if, if, or instructor. See, a disciple is not above see a dis, uh, his rabbi or his teacher or his instructor. Jesus said, you know, a, a disciple will have a teacher. Um, let me just give you one more scripture here. John, John 13, when Jesus... Verse 13 and 14. Uh, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. You call me the teacher, and you call me your Lord. And that's a good and right thing for you to do. So when he's talking to his disciples, he said, It's right for you to relate to me as the teacher, as the, the one discipling you. And you, it's right for you to recognize that I'm actually Lord. Um, I don't know whether um, Lord um, was ever connected in discipling. I think this was a strong, if you want un, one, of, one of the threads that says, Jesus was more than a normal teacher. I'm not sure any of the other teachers ever call themselves Lord. They were a teacher, a master, instructor. It's the only occasion I see where he has said, and you call me Lord and you're right. That was a different relationship. Normally you, you don't. You, you, your disciple was not your Lord. He was your teacher. Jesus said, I'm, I'm taking it up a level. I'm, making this, <laughs> I'm not just your teacher, I'm your God. <laughs> I'm not just someone who's instructing you because you, they had instructors. He said, this is a different relationship at a new and even higher level. But it's still right that you come to me as your teacher. So you say, if I'm going to be a disciple, I must... Come to Jesus. First of all, it's, I, I can't just come to his teachings. I can't just come to him um, abstract and, and take his beliefs and take what he is, has said and connect with that. I don't find it's not enough just to say this is what Jesus um, said, but I've actually, I'm coming to Jesus himself. Let's turn with me to the book of John, chapter 15. This is one of the key passages. When, when um, you know, years ago, when this was all getting, you know, honed and made clear, John chapter 15, these passages, verses 1 through about 11, and Matthew 28, the last, they were two key and critical verses or passages which helped to shape what it is I knew was our mission. Because it makes this powerful statement, um, verse 8, I won't read all of it, won't take all the time, but it says, by this is my Father glorified. Oh, and I'm like, that gets my attention. If, God, if Jesus says, if you want to glorify God, here's how to do it. <laughs> that's, like, that's like we're giving the answer to the exam before the exam, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? You don't have to stumble around trying to work out what it is that he wants. You say, he says, if you want to glorify God, and I don't know about you, but my, I want to glorify God. I actually want to exalt God. I want to lift him up. I want to please him. I, I want to learn what pleases him. But it's not always easy to say what glorifies God. Some people will you know, say, I glorify God by doing this. I say, well, I'm not sure that glorifies God. You know, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says, you can, you can um, give your life as a martyr and it will mean nothing. Well, I would have thought that would glorify God. If you, if you die for him, wouldn't that glorify God? He said, but if you don't, if you don't do it with love, it will mean nothing. So there's a clue for you. Just doing stuff doesn't actually glorify God. Serving doesn't glorify God if it's not done with a heart of love and honor to Him. So they're clues. You know what I mean? They're clues. You, you say, oh, so people say, I'm going to glorify God, and then say, and I will do this, this, and this. If you haven't learned what glorifies God, you could be just spending a lot of energy, and God's like, that doesn't please me. You know, we used to have a dog. We, we've got still got dogs, but this was a dog from a, a previous ownership of dogs called um, Minnie, little schnauzer mixed with a poodle. And she got it in her mind that if she found a dead mouse or something in the backyard or a dead bird, it would just please her owners no end 
to come and present it to us at the back door and say, can I bring this in? This is like the most amazing thing ever. You, you should smell this. This is oh. <laughs> Tails going, brrr, what was left of the tail? Brrr, <laughs> it's like, eyes big. She honestly thought this would please us. I don't want to go to God with a dead bird. He says, I appreciate the heart, but that's not what I want. Do you, do you understand? Learn what it is. So when there's verses that says, by this is my father glorified, these are gold. This is a gold verse. <laughs> tells us what he's looking for. Tells us what he's really interested in. Gives me a chance to hear very close to what God is wanting. Helps us to refine our actions and our words and our lives and our believing. It says, by this is my father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Ah. So being a true disciple, bearing much fruit, brings him a lot of glory. So that's why discipling became a big thing to us. Because if we could be a disciple that brings much fruit, we know we're going to glorify God. Now, we, we had to understand what that all means in the context of this whole passage, which means being connected to the vine, not just doing it out of our own strength. Now, this is not about bearing fruit in our own energy. This is about being connected to Jesus in, as the vine. And there... If you come back with me to verse, uh, well, let's read from verse 4. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, says Jesus. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So that's... I don't know about you, but that sort of indicates Jesus is pretty important to the whole process. And it's, oh, we can go back to that diagram. Oh, um, let's go to the next slide here because I think I've got a definition from a Greek dictionary. Um, it says, the Methodes, the, the disciple, says, to become attached to one's teacher and to become his follower in doctrine and conduct in life. That's the definition of a disciple, to be connected to your teacher and not just follow their teachings, but follow their whole life follow who they are. I'm thinking of the scripture where Jesus said, um, all you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me. And he said, um, I'm just trying to think of the wording, make sure I get it right. He says, you know, and, and take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my, my, my yoke is easy. My burdens, are, uh, my, my burdens are easy. My yoke is light. I, never, I can never remember which one. But they, they're light and easy. But, you know, easy and good. It's a good thing. But he actually encourages us to get in yoke, which is, you know, if you're not sure, that's not an egg. I actually wrote this in notes and it made it Y O L K. And I'm like, no, that's not the yoke he's telling me to get into. Let's fix this up. Yoke is the um, two oxen, you know, so like a wooden harness that goes over their, their shoulders and links the two oxen together, and together they will pull the load. That's a yoke. In Bible times, it was very common, still common in some parts of the world and still, you know, where they have, you know, horses pulling carriages or anything like that. And Jesus said, you come and get in my yoke with me. Now, this is more than just come and learn my teachings. This is come and get in step with me, learn my ways, learn how I do things, go about life like I go about life. Be me in the world. Not just about what you do, but how you do it. So like, like I said, when Jordan was... <laughs> He's got a heart. He says, I don't want to just do it on Sunday morning. I want to do it like Jesus. You know, that type of thing. I don't want, to be, I want, I don't want you know, you can do something. You can do the Lord's work and not represent Jesus well. You know, I remember, um, I remember going to a pastor's conference once. I remember this very clearly. This is 30 years ago. Pastor's conference. Pastor got up and said, um, and he was visiting, uh, his, this pastor was visiting, I think, his mother in hospital. And she was saying, oh, I've got a good doctor. He's good at, he says, he's a pig of a man but a good doctor. Does anyone know a doctor like that? You know what I mean? Terrible bedside manner, terrible manners and, and, and ability, you know, not very nice to deal with, but his knowledge of medicine is good enough that you, you look past that. So he said, he, he's a pig of a man, but a good doctor. And this minister looked out and he said, and there's some good pastors out there. <laughs> Join the dots. Not here. Think of other pastors. All right. 
Said, hey, hey, stop, stop amening. Put your hands down. You can be a good pastor, but a pig of a man. But not if you're following Jesus. You can be a good Christian, but a pig of a person. But not if you're following Jesus. Because Jesus was good and not a pig of a man. He was good. He was kind. He was merciful. The grace of God was worked through him. Now, the Pharisees had got a different picture of him. I, I get that. He, wasn't, he was tough and direct. And, you know, the people, we all say, we go to heaven. And we say, oh, Jesus is just amazing. Say, they say, I was in the temple that day selling produce. <laughs> Remember he went in with a whip, turned the tables over? I was, in the, I was selling produce before I became a Christian. I saw a different side of Jesus that you saw. <laughs> he is tough. Threw the stuff around. Whoa, I ran out of the room. So he can be tough. But in terms of goodness and mercy and love, it's to his core. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you can't just be a good Christian. I've, all my doctrines are in line. I believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe all, you know, I read through the articles of faith and they're all in line. I'm a Jesus of the Year, but it's not just that. It's, that's plus. You've got to walk in my ways. You've got to walk in me. So Jesus, following Jesus, the disciple loves Jesus, abides in Jesus, connects with. It's about following him. And that, that's the core of it. And I'm not even going to put the other five up. I'll leave you in suspense for those because if I put them up, I'll speak to them. And if I speak to them, we get into another message. But there's six things, that five things that flow out of this based on what Jesus Colt told us, if we're going to be his disciples. But the first thing I want to challenge you with is, how can you say, well, I'm a disciple? Well, what you can do then is dig into Jesus a little deeper yourself. Have a little bit more face-to-face -face time with Jesus. Spend some more time just thinking and talking to Jesus. You know, um, I, one of my favorite times is when I'm, I'm reading, you know, my, you know, just reading through different areas of the Bible and, you know, when it's time to read one of the Gospels, it's just like discovering Jesus again. Just asking, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to learn your ways. I want to get in step with you. I want to find out what it's like. Just know about Jesus. So the first thing to do is say, well, we can, if we're going to double down on our mission, the first thing is to let's just dig into Jesus a little deeper ourselves. Let's spend time and just, you know, I, I know it's good to be doing all the other stuff. Those five things are there are really important. But just dig deep into Jesus for a little bit. And then make it your aim. See, discipling, discipling and making disciples is about introducing people ultimately to Jesus, bringing him to Jesus. Now, we've got to make, we, they've got to become followers of Jesus. Like I said, you know, it's not, no good. You, know, you don't want to shortchange people and say, oh, just, you know, just you know, come to church. All you've got to do is just, you know, Attend once a week and you can be a Christian. Oh, Jesus never gave any messages like that. He was like, find the pearl of great price and then sell everything to go get it. It was all-consuming. Everything was involved. And so there's following Jesus, it's, it costs you everything. But it's about following Jesus. And we want to point people to him, ultimately. You know, I, I, want, to, I want to represent Jesus well, but I know that, and what they're getting is the benefit of the fruit through me. <laughs> you know what I mean? By, unless, you know, let me just read that again from John 15. You say, Jesus, I, I'm going to personalize this. Jesus, I abide, in, I abide in you, and you abide in me. And Jesus, just as the branch cannot bear fruit, I, I cannot bear fruit by myself. Unless I'm abiding in the vine, I, so neither can I unless I'm abiding in you, Jesus. Jesus, you are the vine. I'm a branch. And if I abide in you, and you're abiding in me, I will bear much fruit. For apart from you, I can do nothing. That's, that's what we... That's. And then you say, okay, how can I take that message to those around me? How can I introduce them to Jesus? How can I introduce them to, you know... I'm not asking to join the church. I'm asking, don't get me wrong. Following Jesus means 
connecting with the church because that's what a follower does. It's up to five, you'll find there's more to it. But ultimately, we're not asking people to join the church. We're asking them to become a follower of Jesus and then to do that together with his church. So what can you do? Every time I've introduced one of these things, that this is what a disciple loves, I'd like you to ask two questions of yourself and meditate on these two questions. Number one, how can I do this more myself? And two, as a disciple, how can I turn around and help someone else to do it? What can I do to help someone else be introduced to this, to be connected with this? If you do those two things, and we do it for all six areas, Jesus and the other five, we will be doubling down on our mission. If you do it, if you double down on yourself and then double down on what you're doing with us, we will be doubling down on our mission. It's simplified to that. 